All right. How many here? How many of you here are actually doing video, or have done video? I know you've done photography. You're doing it like on your own, or in the church, or as well. Yeah. So. This is just a little demo reel. These are videos I've done over the past years. I've worked with a lot of uh, Christian hip hop artists, and I uh, just kind of wanted to show you some of the some of the work I've done here. Um, so basically, just a little bit about myself before we get into it. I found Christ through Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Anybody, anybody ever heard of that? Back in 1989, my senior year of high school, I was a youth pastor in Nebraska for about two years. Graduated from North Central University in Minneapolis. Uh, I was an inner city missionary uh, for 12 years in Minneapolis, Chicago, and in Harlem. And then I began, started to film these uh, Christian hip hop videos. We started a Christian nightclub in SeaTac, uh, kind of by 208th and 99, where they intersect. We started a Christian nightclub there. And with that, I was pastoring. I started to get this love and desire for video because we started to video these guys' testimonies, guys who came out of gangs, guys who were coming from the streets, prostitutes, pimps. And so we started just doing their testimonies. Well, some of them would rap. I said, hey, let's do a music video. So we do a music video. We were all proud of it. We were excited. Something you'd see on public access. You know, I thought it was great at the time, but, you know, look back on it. Everybody's got to start somewhere, right? So, so... uh I, we closed our church. We, had a, we did a church plant in Seattle for about five years. We closed our church. And then my wife got hired at the Northwest Ministry Network, and I started to do video. I, I said, let me figure out how to do this thing. So I went to Seattle Film Institute, which was in Capitol Hill, and did their night film program and learned a lot there. Uh, since then... Uh, I've been I've done probably 50 plus music videos in the area. I've did a Seahawks anthem that went viral that ESPN played and King Five and Q13 played the year the Seahawks won the Super Bowl in 2013. It's kind of a cool kind of a cool thing and uh, had a chance to win an, an award in 2009, the Inside the Music Awards for Best Video Director. A song called "So Hot." It was a Christian video. It was, you know, it wasn't wasn't all crazy or sexual or anything. That the title can. <laughs> Can, can throw you a little bit, you know. So, uh, so now I work at the Northwest Ministry Network full time. I'm their media director, and being there gives me opportunities to create new episodes, new stories. We started to film our net talks. We started a new episode called Backstage. I don't know if has anybody seen any of those net talks or backstage episodes. We play those on our social media. We play them on our website and so forth. So uh, I call myself a video evangelist. I preach people's messages basically through what I film. I go and, and then I show them worldwide wherever, wherever we can, you know, wherever we go. You know, you can, you can, because of social media, you can see anything anywhere in the world, can't you? Mm -hmm. And so I, so I take people's stories and I preach their story, their testimonies and their videos. And so I call myself a video evangelist and that's kind of what I do. Uh, my daughter... Uh, is in Indonesia. She's a missionary in Indonesia. She's 18 years old. My son, he's in the football. He's a sophomore. He raps. And my wife, Beth, you may know, is she works with pastoral care at the Northwest Ministry Network. So shooting with excellence. So you guys are here because either you have an interest in video or you do video. Someone has tasked you and said, okay, I need you to make videos for me or and, and what does that entail? Some of you maybe have experienced some of this information I talk with you today. You may already know it. Some of it may be new to you. And I want to kind of get through this information so that we do have time for Q&A as well, because I think we have about 45 minutes. So I hope that, is that, that clock's not right. It says it's stopped. It looks like, okay, anyway. So what types of videos do you create in your ministry? And so this is what I tell people. Videos are two things. Number one, they're technical. They're technical because you've got to know certain technical things. Uh, you've got to know, be familiar with the exposure triangle, color temperature, uh, lens type, focal length, what's your depth of field, what's your light wattage. Uh, that reminds me to silence my phone too or Rocky's going to start blasting. I've got, got the eye of the tiger on my ring. So... So uh, video codex, resolution, you know, first thing, the first time I got into video, I didn't know anything about any of those things. I like to take a camera, I like to go out and point and shoot and just capture things. But these were some things that I eventually needed to learn if I wanted to have excellence in what I did. Who, who knows what the exposure triangle is? It's made up of three things. 
Is that sort of Shut, yes, shutter speed. Aperture and ISO or sensitivity, yeah, yeah, which is similar to speed. So videos are technical, but videos are also creative. They're creative. You have to have a, a creative side. You, you have to be able to story tell. You've got to have to have good direction if you're working with actors. What's your composition? What, what do you put in your shot and where does it go? What's the style? What, what is it stylistically? Is it, is it nice, dramatic panning or is it shaky handheld to show something crazy happening? What's your style? What's the continuity like in your editing? Can the person tell what's happening? Can they tell your story even if you don't use dialogue through your continuity of your story? Uh, the reveal. What's the climax? What's the punchline? Those types of things you have to think about. The emotional arc and character development. So I tell people videos are both technical and creative and it's good to have a little bit of both. If you're strong in one area, start to learn a little bit more about the other area. So I say you must have both of these elements to be successful. How many, anybody know who this guy is? Anybody seen this video? Raise your hand if you know this video. It's a viral, <laughs> embarrassingly. <laughs> so. Uh, write down that you got to go on YouTube and watch uh, Pen Apple Pineapple. It's Apple Pen Pineapple oh, Pen. Yeah, yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> so, what captivates you and what keeps you watching? I mean, all you got to do today is is go into your garage, get a camera, do something stupid, put on some yellow, and make up a song that makes no sense, and millions and millions of people will love it and watch it. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's intriguing what people tend to watch. So. Um, can you tell your story without dialogue or text on a screen? What's happening in this shot? And I want to apologize, first of all, for the aspect ratio. These are all widescreen shots, but the projector is doing kind of a 4-3 thing, so these are actually our widescreen shots. But uh, can you tell through your acting and your direction and what you film, what's happening, without text on the screen, without dialogue? One of the first things I learned in film school was how to tell a story without saying anything. Through your shots, can you tell a story? Now, I thought this would be kind of fun. Um, these are some of the videos, and there's no, there's no audio. These are just snippets of some of the type of videos that our churches are doing today. This is Eastridge Church. Obviously, you can see people coming in with certain messages. They have a message where they have a frown, then they have a smile. They have certain marks that they need to hit. Very... Uh, uh, planned out where they go. This is Church on the Ridge. This is a video that they use in their ministry. They're actually trying to audition people for their worship team, people who want to serve tech, people who want to do lighting. They're doing a lot of fun things to engage, you know, doing the whip pans, doing the zooms. He says, don't be like this guy. That's basically what he's saying. And that's kind of a little ad of, of what they're doing, just to try to get people to want to be on their creative arts team. This next one Canyon Creek Church, I don't know if you noticed, these guys got their things in their mouths, and they do the whole video announcement reel with these things in their mouths the whole time. They're, and you know, this isn't even part of the video announcement. They're trying to drink water. They got crackers. They eat watermelon. And I mean, they're just, they're just crazy over Canyon Creek, you know. But, uh, but you know, video, what do you do to engage your audience? This is fun. This is Eric North put this together, Faith Assembly in Pasco. He finds this old tape of what a worship meeting used to be like back in the 80s. And so they have like this flash dance, she's a maniac kind of music going on, and they're showing about how they would exercise a worship exercise video from the 80s, and that's kind of what they're spoofing right here. And I show you to say our churches are doing all kinds of crazy fun things. Why? Just to get your attention, just to get you to see what we can do to help you. Because how many remember when someone comes up to the podium and they tell you there's going to be something in the fellowship hall and they say it, you're not going to remember that. But you are going to remember the guy that put the thing in his mouth and says, come to the fellowship hall. You know? So that's really what we're trying to do. We want to engage our audience. George Lucas said cinema is the new church. And, and I wrote this paragraph, a majority of people may, lo may no longer go to church, but the majority of people have seen the latest movie. How important is it for us to implement video and media into our services, outreach, or gatherings? Church members react, they respond, and relate to this medium that is dominant in our culture. So that's more reason why the church, everybody else is using video, the church needs to use it, and we need to do our best that we can with it. Cameron Crowe, another director, he says, In the future, 
Everybody will be a director. And that's true, isn't it? Filmmaking is no longer for the elite. Because we can get our hands on this stuff. They've made it so that everybody can use it. Cameras and editing systems have been simplified for soccer moms and fifth graders. Because of YouTube, Instagram, and Vine, your influence or potential viewership is limitless. Kind of like pen, pineapple, pen guy. You know, your viewership is limitless with what you create. So these are the three most common videos you know, after doing videos in the church for the last 10, 15 years, these are the three most common videos that are created in most churches or ministries. Number one, the promo. Some type of advertisement of upcoming events or activities. Number two, the recap. Highlights of those events or activities. And then three, the testimony. Inspirational stories and journeys of various individuals. So we're going to talk a little bit about kind of some of those things and some of the rules. Some of you may have heard some of these things before, but... If I have three takeaways from film school, because I was doing videos for five to six years before I went to film school. A lot of you here are making videos. You never went to film school. I'm sure a lot of you have talent. You have things that you've made and created, and you don't have to go to film school for it. And, that was, and, and not everybody really has to. But the things that I did learn, I thought, hmm, lighting and background. That was one of the key things for me, was lighting and background. Um, what type of background do I use what type of things do I want to show and portray? An over-exaggerated example there. There's an example of sometimes where we, uh, maybe we set our exposure to auto. See, in the film world, we call auto, focus auto, we call auto dummy. Because the camera's trying to figure it out for you, but you want to have control. You want to be manual control. So here we have an example of my background is properly exposed, but my subject is not. Right here, this is not bad exposure. But notice right here, I'm just using the lighting from the ceiling. All this is is just light coming from the top, and what do you see? You see shadows. A lot of shadows under the eyes, under the nose, everywhere. And, you know, it, it doesn't make people look very flattering. So, how many have heard of the three-point lighting setup? Three-point lighting. So, three-point lighting is the most common type of setting. This is a top-down view of a subject sitting in a chair. We have a key light and a fill light. So, our camera, if you notice, the camera is at the bottom. But your key light is 45 degrees, and then your fill light is 45 degrees, the other way to the camera. Now, the key, one of the, to me, one of the most key lights here is, or the best lights to use, is the backlight. Something that I see a lot of people neglect to use is the backlight. What it does, it's a light that's up top. It just hits the back of your head and your shoulders. That's all it does. Here's some examples. Can you see where the light is hitting our actors? Now, does anybody know these actors? We flew them in from Hollywood. No, they're actually from Coeur d'Alene. Uh, Dan and Nicole Christ. But this was an interview that we shot years ago. And so in this shot, we have key light and fill light. And then if you notice, if you look at her hair, she has black hair. Black likes to blend in with dark, doesn't it? But if you can see, we have a little bit of light hitting her hair so that she doesn't completely blend in. And part of the is the setting on the projector. You're not really getting a true picture of the exposure here because the projector is a little slightly shows a slightly darker. David Brakey from Alt B A G. So what what kind of setup did we use to light David in this shot? Well here's a diagram. We have our hair light, which is hitting him from behind. We have the key light which is 45 degrees from the camera one way, the fill light 45 degrees from the other, and it's, it's lighting him well, and he's getting a little bit of light on the top of his head as well. Right here, Brent Kimball, down, uh, this was when he was over in, um, oh, what town is that? I don't remember. But uh, here, we're, here we're filming Brent, and we have a key light and a fill light. There is no hair light, but if you notice, we're using a lit background. So three-point lighting is not always a hair light. Three-point lighting can also be a light that's in the background that's causing your subject to stand out. This, is, this right here is, is proof of why you need a hair light on your subject. Black background, black shirt, black hair. If that hair light was not there, all we would see is her skin, and that's it. Maybe a little bit of that badge. And so, again... The hair light is going to give you that shoulder, light on the shoulder, and light on the hair. So that's key. So make sure you're using a backlight. Here we have Justin, and we're doing kind of that, the real trendy Apple look. Everybody's doing the white screen Apple look, right? So what we have here is we have the camera right on him, 
key light and fill light off to each side. But then now we're, for the background, we're lighting the screen. If you want to do this effect, you have to make sure that you're completely lighting your screen now. You can kind of see that's a little bit more exposure here than on this side. Technically, the best way to light white for a, back, uh, a backdrop is you want to use, think of it as quadrants. Or if you're doing green screening, if you're doing any green screening, you want to have a, a light here, a light here, a light here, a light here, hitting the screen not the subject. So it's two layers of lighting, if that makes sense. You have a layer of lighting that's lighting the background. He's actually 10 feet from the screen, and then we have lights hitting him, and it's giving him a good, good exposure. In this shot, how many lights are we using in this shot? More of a dramatic shot. One light. One light from the top. You know, and this is more for a dramatic effect, so we're using one light from the top. And, we, and it's intentional. We don't want to see his face. We want it to seem somewhat mysterious. Okay, there's our guy again. What's that actor's name? I forget his name. Oh, yeah, yeah. So be aware of what's in your background. Now, some of these are photographs. We're talking about video, right? That shot would be okay if he's walking by and happens to pass that. But keep in mind what's in your background. What's in your background? What kind of a, you know, what's, is it going to be distracting to your viewer? What happens when you use lights with a different color temperature in the same shot? So here we're, we got a shot of An, and if you notice, she, she is being lit from the front with the same color temperature, which is tungsten, which is 3400. But the background is not. So what happened is that we had a logo down here. We had these letters. These were our net talks that we shot last year. And we wanted to light them, but we ran out of tungsten light. So we grabbed a light that was daylight temperature. But what did it do to our background? What does the background look like? If you cut from these two shots, it's distracting. Because in this shot, it looks kind of, it's more, it's more kind of greenish purple. This is more purple blue. So those are things to think about in your shot. Maybe make sure your lights are using the same color temperature so that when you're cutting back and forth between shots, it's not distracting. Because that can be distracting seeing that. So when I talk about lighting and backdrop price points, three point lighting kits, they can range from $200 to $1,200, whether you're using an LED, tungsten, or Kino. Um, are you guys familiar with types of lighting, LED, Kino, Flow, Tungsten? Uh, if you go on Amazon, and I typically go on Amazon, or I go to B&H Photo or Autorama.com, I can, I can get all kinds of lighting. Lighting, LED, they're kind of like the lights of the future. They're great. They're cool. They shoot, most of them, daylight temperatures, but you've got to be really close to the subject. You've got to be close. Tungsten, very powerful. You can shoot with a tungsten light from far, far away, but they're very hot. Have you ever been in a room where you're interviewing someone, you have three tungsten lights, and everybody's sweating? Especially if your interviewer is maybe wearing a suit or a coat or a jacket. But they, they, uh, it will um, light a much greater area. Kino Flow. This is what you'll see if you walked on the set of Oprah or King 5. they got Kino Flows. They're all hanging from the ceiling. And that's what they're using. They're the best of the best. They're cool. They're not hot. But it might be 1500 to 2000 per light. So... Things to think about. Ask your, you know, just ask your lead pastor. He'll get you six of those for a kids' church. So backdrop kit, real easy. You know, you can get a little backdrop kit. I recommend if you use backdrops, go at least minimum 10 feet wide by 12 feet high. Because if you're going to shoot, if you're going to have your subject stand 10 feet from your backdrop, which is technical, which is what you want to do, they're going to start to get out of your background because now you move your camera away and now you have all this distance whereas if you're just using a 5 by 7 you don't ever put your person right back up to your backdrop because of shadows and so forth so those are, those are pretty cheap you can find those for sixty to two hundred dollars seamless rolls of paper don't use cloth don't use cloth whether it's black white if you're trying to do green screen chroma key use paper you can you can buy a roll of seamless White, seamless red, blue, black, you can buy those from Glaciers in Seattle or you can buy them on Amazon. They're about $70 a roll though. They, they tend to be about 9 feet wide by 50 feet long. So let's say when we were, I don't know if any of you were at the rendezvous retreat, we did a big wall and we had a, a big white backdrop that we rolled out. The nice thing you can do is you can roll it all the way out where people can stand on it as well. And it gives that idea like it's a, like a cyclorama, like an endless floor. 
And so that's the nice thing you can do with paper. You can't do that with cloth. Cloth tends to wrinkle, and then when you put it away, you've got to fold it up. Well, then you've got to bring out the iron again. Or you've got to use your, your clamps, and you're trying to pull that thing tight. So use paper if you can, or even better, paint a wall. If you have like a media room or something, just paint a wall white or paint a wall green or whatever, you, whatever color you want it, come in and paint it each time. So, moving on, third best practice that I learned from Seattle Film Institute, composition. The nature of something's ingredients or constituents, the way in which a whole or mixture is made up. So when you frame your shot, you're really telling a story. What is in your shot? There's a wide shot. There is a, like a close-up shot right there. When filming an event or when telling a story, communicate with these shots. Use this language. ES, WS, MS, what are those? I'm going to tell you a story. When I, I had a friend of mine, we were shooting a boxing documentary in Everett, and I said, I need you to go, I need you to get footage of, this, of all these fights. He goes. I'm thinking he's going to get some great footage. He stood at the back the whole time and just got wide shots of the whole thing. He never went in and got anything with the action. He never, and so I said, and so when I got all the footage, it was great. I had, I had a great five or ten seconds of footage to show the beginning, but then I had nothing else. I couldn't tell a story from one angle. So ESWS, some of you might know what this is. Establishing shot. Anybody know this house? Establishing shot. Where does the story begin? What is a reference point? Where does it begin? What, where are we? What's going on? Um, if you're shooting it with an ES, you're going to want to use a 14 to 24 millimeter lens. Now, if you can use prime lenses, great. If not, you, then use a, a, a lens that can zoom. But 14 to 24 millimeters is what you're going to use. Where are the best establishing shots at your outreach or your service? You're doing some event. What do you want to show? Is it the big inflatable? Is it the church? Is it the football field? What is it? Where are you? Are you in the street? Are you doing a block party? Wide shot, the full picture. Who are the actors? Where are they? Who are the main players? What are they doing? Typically, it's a full body shot. And you want to use a 24 to 35 millimeter lens for this shot. And when I say this, you're, you're the same distance away each time. We're, we're, let's pretend that we are, we are eight feet from our subject. And we're going to use a 24 to 35 millimeter lens in this shot. What is your event? Who's there? And what are they doing? A medium shot. It lets you see where they are, but also close enough to see facial expression. Waist ahead. A lot of times medium shots can show a crowd. They can show a couple people. Uh, you want to use a 35 to 50 millimeter lens. How can you zone in on the pieces of this whole story? An MCU, a medium close-up, frames the person a little tighter head to chest. How can you personalize a story? A 70 to 85. Again, I'm, eight, I'm still 8 feet away, but I'm using a 70 to 85 millimeter lens. That gets me in tighter and I start to get defocusing in the background. If my subject is far away, now everything in the background is going out of focus and now I'm just focused on him and that intense phone call. Close up, a CU, the personal shot, tight shot of the face, no head space, no headroom at all when you do a close up. You cut them at the forehead, you leave a little bit of chin space, that's a true close-up shot. A lot of times people will, will put space or too much space in their close-ups and it just doesn't look right. An 85 to, 100, 85 to 105 millimeter lens, you're 6 to 8 feet from the subject, that's what you're going to get in that shot. What emotion is expressed in this story? Extreme close-up. Anybody know what movie this is? You know? Anybody else? Oh. Ferris Bueller. Yeah, Ferris Bueller. All right, there we go. Extreme close-up. Cameron is noticing. He's looking at the picture in the, in, the, in the art gallery. It's a very tight shot of the face. Example, eyes only or mouth only or ear to show extreme emotion or reaction. How intense is the emotion expressed in the story? You want to use 105 to 200 millimeters for this shot. So I have an app on my phone. Write this down, or I think I might have it in your note. Set my cam pro. And the thing I love, I can't, it might be $3, it might be free, I'm not sure. This is a great app because it'll tell you how, what 
what your focus is, and what your depth of field is. There's other functions on there, but I use it for depth of field. For example, if I'm filming, if I'm filming with a 35 millimeter lens, and my aperture is at f4, and I'm five feet from my subject, I know that at five feet, I'm in focus. At 4.5 feet is my near focus, and 5.5 is my Far focus, meaning I only have a foot that's in focus. Does that make sense? I only have that's 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 what depth of field is. That's how much, and that's the thing that everybody is trying to achieve nowadays. Is they're trying to achieve shallow depth of field, and I try to say it's kind of like a range of focus that you're trying to achieve. You want this person or this thing in focus, but everything else goes out of focus, or you want to move from my face to this bottle. I want to be able to rack focus or pull focus. So Set My Cam Pro is a great app to use because it'll give you everything. Preferred camera settings. Always shoot at 24 frames per second or 24 FPS or we say 24p uh, for storytelling videos. If you're telling a story, you're telling a testimony story, you, you want to show something dramatic, shoot in 24p. Don't shoot in 30 or it'll look like a soap opera. News, sports, they'll shoot at 30. But 24p is the, is the frame rate that they use in film, and it's, and, it's, and it's a better frame rate to use. If you're going to use 30, if you're doing like a live sermon or a message, or if you're live streaming something, like a, like a sermon, then use 30 frames. Use 30 frames per second. You still can use 24, but 24 has a different motion to it. Okay, here's the thing. We talk about the exposure triangle, right? Shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. Those are your three things that help balance you. But the, the, limita the one limitation in video is if you change your shutter speed in video, you're going to start to get this jerkiness. Who's ever seen Saving Private Ryan? They call it the Save It Private Ryan effect, where everything is just jerky and jittery. You want to shoot at 1 50th or 1 48th, your shutter speed. And that means... You don't have much range. If you've got to let more, it's, let's say you've got to get rid of some light. Let's say you're shooting at 1.8 and you're, you're wide open and you want this nice shallow depth of field and it's still too bright, then you want to use a neutral density or ND filter. It's kind of like giving your camera sunglasses. So use an ND filter when you're shooting wide open. And when I say wide open, if I'm shooting at 1.2 or 1.8, a really wide, I'm letting a lot of light into the camera, use, use an ND filter. Keep your ISO as low as possible. ISO, you can bump that up, let's say you're a dark, let's say you went into the sanctuary right now, you wanted to get shots of somebody praying, and it's so dark. You can bump your ISO up, but keep it as low as possible. Sometimes I don't like to go above 800 or 1000, but it depends on your camera too. That, that C100 right here, this can shoot all the way up to 24, thousand ISO, you can go to about 14,000 ISO be, before you start to see noise or grain, whereas the 5D camera down there, and once I get to about a thousand, I start seeing a little bit of noise. So keep your ISO low to reduce that noise in your camera. Letterbox, 2.35 by 1, that's a cinematic aspect ratio. A lot of times I'll use that. Now we're mostly using widescreen, everything, most, almost everything is 16.9 now. This, this, what we see here, is pretty much is 4.3, right? Uh, because of our, our settings with our projector. But most cameras shoot 16.9. Nobody shoots SD anymore, and nobody does 4.3 anymore. So 2.35 is a cinematic aspect ratio, and it's a preference that I, I like to use. Um, cameras should have minimal movement, meaning if there's a lot of action happening, let the action do the movement. Let your camera do minimal movement. The reason why is if you take a camera, like a D most of us are probably using DSLRs or C100s or th cameras like that, most of us are, or iPhones, and if you move it around, you get this thing called rolling shutter or the jello effect. And so let, let, your, let your people, let your action do all the moving. Prime lenses will always look better than zoom lenses. And again, set my cam pro, great app to use. Okay, good versus bad. Be biggest difference between a good photograph and a mediocre one is composition. What one person finds pleasing, someone else will not. Composition is largely a matter of personal taste, so technically there is no right or wrong composition. It's kind of like the rules of art are there are no rules, but there are some things here that we can learn. Which one is the better shot? If you were to look at these, which shot do you think is the better shot? The one on, the one on this side? 
Why is that the better shot? Why would you say? It's tighter. It's tighter. One of the things is too much headroom. A lot of times, sometimes we'll have too much headroom. It's not a terrible shot, but there you can always shoot a better shot. Too much headroom, one of the things that we notice. Why would we label one good composition? Why would we, la- would we label one bad composition? Why do you think that is? Background. Background could be also. How is the person positioned? Yeah. If we use the rule of thirds, he's a little bit more over to this side. And, and whenever someone's looking this way, traditionally you want to give them space to where they're looking. Whereas here he doesn't have enough space to where he's looking. If you ever watch an interview, an over-the-shoulder interview, there will always be space to where the person is looking. Camera positioning, good or bad? <laughs> Why is that bad? Yeah, you make people look not very good. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I've learned about even in photography and video, if you can get eye level or even higher, it's always better. And and I see this happen a lot. People will put their camera on a tripod and it'll be like waist level shooting up at them, and and it does not make the person look as good. So here's one of our famous actors again that we had flown in from Hollywood. Camera positioning. Good or bad? Where's the camera in relation to the face? The camera was probably about his, about his chin level. We're far away. So, but we, it, it could be higher in that shot. Framing groups of people. How do you frame groups of people? Because um, a lot of times you're filming events. Where's the focus? I have this thing where I say, I, whenever I'm shooting a group, I try to either get somebody all the way in or all the way out. I try not. Now, I know with video, that's different. People coming in, coming out. But if people are stationary, I either try to frame them in or frame them out. Now, this is from a, a clip from Ocean's Eleven from years ago. But, again, this is video. This is a still shot taken. So this guy could have been moving in or this could have been a panning shot. But I always try to cut off. If I see somebody cut, I want to try to at least make it seem like nobody's cut off, if possible, in my shots. In this shot, this is a profile shot. What is the significance of character placement in this shot? This old, the old karate kid, they're in the car, the car's not going to start, but there's, when you look at people, their profile in the car, and they're all three people sitting, you're only going to see the first person. They're very intentional about how they place the people. He's leaning forward, she's slightly leaning forward, she's not. So think about how you want to frame your people. Rule of thirds. You guys have heard, everybody here heard of the rule of thirds. Um, using, taking that, your, your full shot and cutting it into thirds and placing your composition in those spots. This baby is in the, it would be my left, your right third. Same thing with this lighthouse, using the rule of thirds vertically, but also horizontally we're using the rule of thirds for that horizon. Here we're using the rule of thirds. Again, rule of thirds. Again. Don't want to meet her. <laughs> Misery. Rule of thirds. Profile shot, rule of thirds. Now, this is different. Is this rule of the thirds? What would you say in this shot? They're almost... This is a little skewed because of the projector, but exceptions to the rule. They're more almost halfway. They're not really in the third, but I think in this shot, they want to reveal where they are. They're at bed They're in Brooklyn. Also in this shot, it's a wide shot, and typically in a wide shot, they are in the lower third, but typically if you were going to frame two people, you would kind of want them to fill the frame a little bit more. But in this shot, they want to show, this is from the King's speech, they want to show that there's a lot of this vastness of this room, but that there's also tension. And in this shot, you sense tension because... He's so close, he's, we call this a constrained shot, because we want to show that he feels claustrophobic and that he does not like where he is, so we're, we're not giving him space. The trends, you also got to know the trends. Um, here he is in an interview, Michael Bennett. Typically, we would, if he's looking that way, we would put him here. But ESPN has been starting this trend where they're starting to do a lot of their interviews where they have the person close to the end of the other end of the frame. All right. Here we have our person completely centered in the middle because it, we want to show for 
forthrightness that he's he's dominant and he's showing and telling something. So he's matter of fact. Again, we want to show this is exception to the rule. It's not using the rule of thirds, but we're showing something that's very right there in your face. Over the shoulder, over the shoulder shots. So a camera that is right over the shoulder of one person showing the shot of the other. So this is an example of kind of a medium shot over the shoulder interview setting. Here's an example of an acting setting uh, where two people are conversing and we have an over the shoulder shot there. Here is an interview setting. It's over the shoulder, but it's not actually over the shoulder. It's more removed, but it is still technically an angle of over the shoulder. Camera positioning. Where do you put your camera? That really determines what's happening. Here we're displaying dependence by the way our camera is positioned. Here we're showing dominance or fear or intimidation with our camera being low coming up at the drill sergeant. And one of my biggest pet peeves when filming with a phone, do you hold it correctly? <laughs> so whenever I get edited footage from, people always send me footage to edit, and I get vertical video, and it's very hard to edit with. And so you either have to blur something, and because you've watched what the news does, the news will take this, and they'll blow it up, put it behind this clip, and then they'll defocus it, mm -hmm. is what they'll do. And so you'll, that's, that's basically kind of what the news does rather than just leave these large black vertical boxes. So third thing that I learned was marking my shots and I'm going to kind of fly through this here. Which one, this is relates to editing, which one was the good take? Which one was good? I don't know. I don't remember. I gotta go back and watch them all. So this is where we talk about using a marker. I, I, one of the biggest things I learned was why we use these things. I'll tell you, every time I do an interview with a pastor or I go to a church, they're always like, oh, wow, Hollywood, what are you going to do with that? What is that for? And all it is is just telling you what take you did. It's just telling you which shot it is. And, and it saves you hours and hours of editing when you use these. This is to sync the audio and the video. Uh, with the spike. Your, in your audio waveform you'll see a spike and then on your camera you'll also capture audio and then you match those two uh, pieces of audio up and then get rid of the, uh, the bad audio. If that makes sense hopefully. So here we are Dave Cole and I just put enough information. I don't have to put what camera, director, role because we don't use film roles but I just put enough information on there just to let me know what's in this shot. This is Dave. We're shooting it for Rise. It's a medium shot. It's take two of section one. That day we shot three different things. One was about Rise. One was about lead seminar and one was about his book or something. And so if I have all these, if I don't use a marker, I'm not going to know which one goes with which one because he didn't bring a change of clothes that day. Sometimes I have him change clothes if we're doing a different video. So why do we mark our shots? It identifies the event, the person, the scene, the section, it, the take of each shot. It syncs video with audio. It saves hours of editing when uploading or archiving. And it's essential when shooting with multiple cameras. Real quick, I'm going to show you an example of why we mark our shots and how we do it. Um, so this is just a little, there's no audio here, just a video. So we have, we have, this is a three camera setup. So right now you're seeing what camera three sees. And that's, we use that to mark our shot. And, and that, it has to be in frame of each camera. And we'll show this in the next shot. So I'm marking camera two and then I'm marking camera three. So now this example is going to show me this next one. So that's camera three. So now we're on camera one. Everything's all synced together. We mark camera one. Scene one, take one, Ben. Camera two. Scene one, take one. These are all speeding at the same time. And then camera three. And so we put all those together and that marker lets us know that all those clips belong together from all those cameras. When we shoot our net talks, we use five cameras and if we don't mark our shots, it's kind of a mess. Okay, so real quick, just some real quick pointers here. So we talked about how the promo is, is an advertisement or an upcoming event. What I always say when you're making promos, especially if we're focusing, especially with children's ministry, produce multiple promos 
for social media for that event. Make something that can go on Instagram and Snapchat that's geared towards kids. Create promos that target adults in the weekend services and put that on Facebook. Kids aren't on Facebook anymore. It's all adults. And so, so make every different kind of video for every different part, type of person that you're trying to create. Filming points for your event. These are some points. Secure a videographer and a photographer. Um, a lot of cameras today, video cameras, will shoot video and photography, but it's really hard to go back and forth and change your settings. If you can, get someone who does just pictures and get someone who just does videos, if you can do that. Keep your video cameras on a tripod or a monopod. So I have a tripod here, and I have this monopod here. Now this is great for events that I'm doing, because what I can do is I can move around, I can walk through crowds, I can get quick shots, and then, and then if, I ha if I zoom in really tight, it's, I have stabilization. Because if I'm zooming in with a 200 or 300 millimeter lens, and I'm handheld, it's just going to be shaky. There's no way. You just cannot hold it. You can't hold it steady. So this monopods work great. Uh, capture B-roll of everything. Whether it's whatever it is, capture as much B-roll as possible. Oh, that's going to fall on me. I already know it. So this monopod is a great, great, great tool. Uh, capture B-roll of everything. Again, wide, action, close-up, special moments. Are the confetti canisters going to go off at 8 o'clock at the outreach? Be there. Be ready for that. No, I always, whenever I go to an event and I film something, I always get their run sheet to know when and where everything is. I ask the questions. What are the special things you want filmed? What do you want to see happen? And they tell me. Capture video on a stationary camera of the main stage. The reason why I say this is capture video of capture video of, of all kinds of things that are happening with B-roll, but also with a cam with also with a camera at the back, capture the audio as well, because then you can pick up sound bites. When we were at our men's conference, we built, we filmed all kinds of things, but then when Clint Gresham or Tyler Lockett got up to speak, we got their sound bites and we got their messages as well, and those go in well with recaps. So use a zoom lens to get unintrusive shots. Again, someone's at the altar. You don't want to come with this 24 millimeter lens because you've got to come three feet, two feet from them to get that shot. You want to get a shot of worship or something. You don't want to bug them. Zoom in with a 200 or 300 lens on a monopod or a tripod to get those unintrusive shots. Change your white balance when you go inside and outside. Okay, if, you see, if you're inside and we set our white balance in here, we're getting shots, and then I go outside, my shots are gonna, my footage is gonna look blue because now it's sunlight color temperature. I need to continually change my white balance back and forth to wherever I am. Have a roaming host do interviews or takeaways. Ask permission. Always ask permission if possible. We, when we shot some Seahawk anthems, the Sea Hulk was out there. We didn't just shoot him. We said, hey, can we film you? He was cool about it. He let us film him. Show the magnitude. Show the magnitude of your event. We talked about close-ups, and that's, cut, that's good. But show the magnitude. And when I say show the magnitude, show the crowd. Don't frame in a bunch of empty chairs. Don't frame in different things. Show what's happening. There's times where if, if, if a room was kind of bare, then I get tied in on the action. There's so many times where I've shot music videos where I make it look like I'm in a, in a nightclub and I only have 12 people. They all, I, I, I tape off a box on the floor and they all stand in there and I get in there and I shoot tight and it looks like we're in a hopping club. Show the spiritual element and the fruit. How can you show the spiritual element and the fruit? Really, really, that's why we're all there in the first place to begin with. We're not just there just to do something because, as Don Ross would say, then we're just, we're just no different from like an Elks Club or some type of a thing. He says, why are we here? We have purpose. We have spiritual. No plans to edit it? Film it anyway because I guarantee you six months, a year, two years from now, you're going to want footage and you're going to be glad you filmed it. The recap, highlights of those events, have a good archiving system, have two hard drives, name and date all your footage. Do your recaps in 30 to 60 seconds. Don't do a, a 10 minute recap. <laughs> 30 to 60 seconds is good. That can be shown anywhere. That can be shown on social media. That can be shown in your service. That can be shown anywhere and people will want, 
want to see what happened. Buy stock audio tracks. Don't use copyrighted music. You throw that thing on YouTube and it's going to tell you third party warning. Vimeo won't let you put it on if you tried to use the Hillsong song. So get on something like Audio Blocks or Shutterstock or one of these, one of these um, uh, where you can buy uh, uh, un not copyrighted footage or, or video. You can get uh, stock footage as well. And sometimes you can buy tracks for five bucks, ten bucks, thirty bucks, and you can use that. And then once you have it, you own it. You can use it in other stuff as well. Edit to the music. If there's a lot of, you know, drum beats, do some cuts to that. You know, do different things like that. Follow the most recent editing trends. What's, what are the what are the latest trends? You know, when The Office, when that TV show came out, that was. One of the no one had ever done a show like that, where you follow the people around and you zoomed in on one person and then went over here and then they would do these kind of interviews. Yeah, I like working with so and so, but he's really kind of a jerk, you know. And then they come back to the the all the other pieces, and so that was a trend that became popular. Uh, and so there's other shows that have followed that trend. What's the one about the little community center? What's that show? Parks and Recreation. There's lots of shows. So, so what are the trends? And I, I find the trends by watching movies, watching commercials. I watch documentaries. I watch a lot of YouTube, a lot of Vines, all kinds of things. Because, you know, kids are creating Vines like crazy. They're just, and they tell a story in six seconds. How can you tell a story in six seconds? Well, they're doing it. And you learn a lot from watching what the younger generation is doing. The testimony, inspiration, I, and I kind of veered, made this more for testimony, working with kids on camera, but I always say film with a family member or a close friend in the room if you're doing a testimony of a kid or that type of thing. Be patient, smile, show support. Have them tell you a joke or a funny story before filming to loosen them up. I would do these baptism videos when I worked at Eastridge Church, and uh, the kids would be so scared. I'd say, hey, tell me a joke. They'd tell me a joke. They'd start laughing, and then I couldn't get them to shut up, you know, because they were just so comfortable, and they were excited, and then they would had no problem telling me about why they wanted to be baptized and how they love Jesus. Make it simple. Make it repeatable. No more than two or three main points. And sometimes it's good to have them look off camera so they're looking at the person who's asking them the questions and then you can be off to the side actually capturing their interview and then they feel more comfortable. They don't feel so afraid there with the camera in their face. Get an image release form signed by a parent. Use cinema lenses if you can. Uh, I have a bunch of lenses up here. I have a, uh, and I stopped buying lenses because I learned I could rent like these cinema lenses, I could rent a $5,000 cinema lens for $80 for three days and do my shoot and have this amazing footage. So I stopped buying lenses. I started to rent lenses through borrowlenses.com. So you got to look up borrowlenses.com. Um, so anyway, I know I don't know what time we got to go and I know we're kind of a little over, but do you guys have any thoughts, insights, any questions? Uh, hey, Renny. It is online. It is online. And, they, and so they, want, they typically want to ship it to a business where they could probably, it's probably safe if they send it to your church. Like if you have somebody there or, or a, a reputable business and they'll ship those, those lenses right to you. And then you typically have to drop them off at like FedEx or UPS mm -hmm. drop off area. So yeah, great, great lenses. With the, with the proper packaging to send it back? Yes. Oh yeah. They give you the box. They typically give you like a like a, one of those pelican cases. So see, I have a big case right there with foam in it. They'll send you a case with foam in it. All you gotta do is put it back in, and put the return label on it, tape it up, send it back. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And sometimes you can rent even some of the Canon L lenses. Like if you're using the Canon or a Nikon, you can rent these like 85 millimeter prime lenses, 550 millimeter prime. You can use those and just test them out. And sometimes those are like uh, $30 a week to rent. And so you can really get a lot there. So what kind of cameras are you guys using when you video stuff? Do you know what kind they are? Who, who right now is actually Motorola? Motorola? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many of you here have your ministry has a camera? They're Canons. Yeah, Canons. Are they DSLRs? Or? Yeah. When I did photo, yeah. I don't have video capability. Would you would you mind hitting that turn that light on for me? 
my man? Yeah, thanks. So, so, um, so for example, right here, these are, these are very common. People started to use these, have been using these. This is a Canon 5D Mark II, and you can put about any lens on it. It's great. It gives you great footage. Right now it has a 50 millimeter prime lens, so which... It does, yeah, yeah, you can shoot video on this. And actually, a lot of independent filmmakers were using these and still do use these, uh, just a 5D. Um, and so I can put a $5,000 Zeiss 85 millimeter prime lens on this because it has the EF mount. You have to specify what mount you want if you rent mm -hmm. that. But I say 85 millimeter prime, uh, 2.0 aperture, and you wouldn't believe the, the images it gives you. Pretty awesome. So now here's the thing, if you're using audio, the audio capture on these things are terrible. This camera, this, is, this was made, this is a C100, this was made to accept audio, so you're good. Your audio and your video are linked here. But if you're gonna use something like this, something with um, a video with a camera like this, you wanna capture, use another, like a field recorder. This is a zoom recorder, and you can plug in XLR, and it has two inputs. Plug in a mic, I have a lapel mic that I use, and then what I do is then I, I get this going, I say sound, sound speed, camera, somebody says camera speed, whoever's operating it, they're both recording. I say it, I say okay, Fred, interview, take one, and I hit my, my spike. I show this in my shot, and I say it, because when I go to my audio file, I'm gonna hear Fred interview, take one, and then I know that waveform, that wave file goes with my MOV video file, and that spike, that's, we'll line it up. Now, some editing softwares, Final Cut Pro will auto-sync your footage for you. I don't know if Premiere Pro does it, does that or not for you, um, but, uh, but uh, that's, that's a great tool. So this right here is a 75 to 300 millimeter lens. It's not the best of the best lenses, but if you want to zoom in on tight footage and you want to really get good footage of like people from far away, or if you want to achieve like a real shallow depth of field here, because the, the f-stop is, is a 3.5, well, no, it's, it's 4 to 5.6. It's not good for dark, but outside, or if you have good lighting, you can, it's a great lens, it's about $200 to buy, and it's a great lens to have, and actually, with some of the interviews I do, I'll use this lens, I just make sure I'm lit well, and it gives me a, a pretty good picture. So, this right here is, is a Phantom 4 drone that we use to get establishing shots. We just, just two hours ago, went and got some shots of Stone Church with this, and it was crazy, because I, I turned it on, I use an iPad as my monitor, and it says, it looks and it says, uh, uh, this warning box says, you, ha you are in a restricted area, mm -hmm. and check this box if you take responsibility for flying in this area. <laughs> and I'd never seen that before, and I was like, oh man, and Levi, their video guy, was with me, and I said, okay, well, we're going to take a chance here. So we <laughs> took it up, we got some shots, and I didn't get cuffed and stuffed by the FBI, nobody came and got me yet, so... So anyway, anybody else got any thoughts, uh, questions? I think we, I don't know when the next, does anybody have a schedule? I don't know when we, three three. we yeah, at three. Any, any last thoughts, questions? Uh, what about editing wise would you say is your favorite? Um, well, okay, um, Premiere Pro is really good and so is Final Cut Pro 10. The reason why I use Final Cut Pro 10 is because it's only $300. And I could, it's, a, it's an app. If you're using Mac, if you're using PC, I would recommend Premiere Pro, Adobe. It's an Adobe editing. Um, you used to be able to edit okay in iMovie, but I, they really screwed up iMovie, uh, so I wouldn't use it. Um, you can use it for maybe some highlight reels, but if you really want to do more extensive editing, if you want to add effects and so forth, After Effects is a great program to have as well. If you want to use that, uh, Adobe products can be used on PC or Mac. How many Mac people do we have here? How many PC? So either way, you can accomplish the same thing on either one, but uh, if you're on PC, I'd say use Adobe Premiere for editing. Yeah. Who, who's been filming? What's the last thing you filmed? Somebody tell me, what's the last thing you filmed? Sermons. Sermons? Yeah? 
filmed our kids' series video. Yeah? What did you guys do in that? Uh, we did like this dinner theater type thing, so we had to like use a green screen, had to have all the lights lighting it up. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah. Good deal. Interesting. What camera did you guys use for that? I can't remember what kind of camera she has. I used a Canon, but she had an iPhone. Yeah. Yeah, and you can still do that, accomplish the same thing. Yeah. Nikon has great lenses. Yeah. I'm interested in teaching a cinematography merit to our uh, expedition and adventure rangers. So oh, yeah. I know I haven't gotten very much into it myself, but I know our church has, uh, I mean, we do we do multiple venues, so we have uh, you know, a live camera on the preacher, and, mm. and it's DVR'd and broadcast in the other one. We mm. also do uh, video announcements and things at the mm. beginning, so I know our church has the mm. capability. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, did you guys get it? Did you guys, did you learn anything? I hope you did. I'm so. very, yeah, Okay. Yeah. And, you know, um, just let me know. Please, my email's on here if you have any other questions. You know, part of me being at the network is I really want to help hook people up with whatever we can, whatever tools you need to get. You know, I want to help advise, give you insight on what would be good for you guys to get. You know, right now, like I have different media people from churches saying, what do I use to like record my sermons or those types of things. And I come from a post-production world where I'm making short films and music videos and those types of things, but maybe, but, and, and kind of stepped into the church world that way. But, I, but I've learned a lot, and there are a lot of good churches out there that I've worked with that I could help you guys with set up whatever you want to do, try to help you. So anything else? Anybody else? You want to share your uh, PowerPoint there? What's that? You want to share, share your PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, email me and I'll send you the, the PowerPoint file. Yeah, yeah. If you guys want the PowerPoint file. Yeah. Yeah? Great, good, good. All right, well, thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. You guys just enjoy the rest of the fusion.